Well, good evening and welcome. This is our session on careers and in project management and business analysis. I'm Ray Fraunhofer. Uh, I've been a project manager and a program manager for about 35 years, an adult educator for about 30, a PMI volunteer for about 15. So I've been around the block a few times in project management. And I'm here tonight with my friend and colleague, Greta Blash. Uh, we're going to uh, first talk a little bit about careers in project management and business analysis from the perspective of what are they. And then uh, Greta is going to uh, help you understand a little bit more about business analysis and how to choose the right career path. And then I'll come back and uh, talk just a little bit about the certificate programs themselves. Now, uh, I'd like to have an interactive session. So if anybody uh, has any questions uh, at any time, you know, feel free to raise your hand and uh, let, it, let us know that uh, you, you'd like us to discuss something further. Sound good? All right. So first, let's talk about what is project management, right? This is a, a, a term, you know, like agile and other things we hear. It's a buzzword. Lots of people like to use it. So it's good to put a definition around it. And project management is the process of organizing and managing resources. Well, resources, that can be people, equipment, materials, uh, any of the resources such that those resources are used to deliver all the work to create a product, a service, or some other result, like changing a business process or uh, changing an organization. So we also want to make sure that that product, service, or other deliverable is completed within time, cost, and quality constraints and meets or exceeds the expectations of customers. Right? So that's, a, that's a, a pretty tight definition. There's not a lot of uh, wiggle room in that. So as a result, you know, one of the things, uh, one of the problems we encounter is that today, less than 50% of projects uh, succeed, right? Less than 50% succeed. But the good news is that this is a drastic improvement over what it was maybe 20 or 30 years ago. Um, the remainder are typically challenged. That means they have problems with time, they have problems with budget, they have problems with resources, or they're canceled, right? And, and they're just uh, left uh, and maybe, maybe resurrected years later and, and maybe not. Um, studies by the Project Management Institute and other organizations and academic research as well have shown that there are two primary causes for project failure. The first is that the users, right, the people who are going to use that product or service aren't involved, and the executive sponsors, the people who are commissioning this work, aren't involved. And so without their involvement, you can't find out exactly what it is that you want to build. The other, the other thing is by engaging the executive sponsor, you can find out what they value most, what's going to satisfy them, right? So maybe the executive sponsor has deep pockets and doesn't care how much the project costs, but wants it delivered on a very tight deadline. You've got to find that out. You've got to make sure that you're managing to the right constraints and not just blindly accepting all three to be dictated to you, right? The second cause, and which is why we're here talking about business analysis, is that clear and well-managed requirements become elusive, right? That uh, very often uh, organizations and projects fail to nail down exactly what it is that someone needs and how we're going to solve their problem, how we're going to create that work product. So <clears throat> the Project Management Institute has uh, launched a, an effort into business analysis. Uh, they actually have a new certificate themselves uh, called the PMI uh, PBA, Professional Business Analyst, uh, which is designed to help people with a career in business analysis. So 
one of the problems we have with uh, project management being a buzzword is everybody wants to do it, right? And so before you know it, you've got everything being called a project. Right? I, I had a student actually in uh, one of my classes that said, I work on 72 projects every week. And I said, wow. How can you possibly do that? I can remember working on maybe three to five really small projects where some were starting, some were ending, and maybe one or two were in the middle, but I couldn't possibly manage 72 projects in a week. So I, so I began to ask questions. Well, what is it exactly that you do? Well, he worked for a company that created chemical solutions. They were custom solutions that were sold you know, to pharmaceutical companies, I guess, and, and other companies that needed chemical solutions. What he was doing was mixing 72 solutions in a week. Now, were there elements of project management to that? Sure, there was a project charter, right? Somebody needed a solution, right, and, and char chartered that work. Uh, was there a budget involved? Yes, somebody had a budget for it. But did it really involve all the overhead and things that you need for project management? Right? And the answer was no. And what happens is we introduce complexity by calling everything a project. And so Antonio Nieto Rodriguez, uh, he's the chairman of the board of the Project Management Institute right now. Uh, he recently wrote an article uh, for CIO.com, and uh, his article was titled Less is More, right? And what he thinks organizations should do, and this is something that I, I've uh, talked about for many years as well, is put a definition to what's a project, what is the project management responsibility here, um, then apply that definition to reduce that list. So I'm guessing that if we went to that company that had the 72 projects, that we'd find that there was maybe really an occasional project or two, like changing our operation of creating solutions, right? not necessarily manufacturing a solution uh, every week. So once you get that definition and you shorten the list, then the next step is you've got to really apply it smartly to the rest of the projects to make sure that the uh, scale is correct. You know, I, I, I often use a quality example because this helps put things in uh, the, the context. So let's suppose that you were um, uh, an egg farmer and you were producing eggs. Right? If I had to break every egg to determine the quality of the egg, I wouldn't be in business very long. Right? So we have to find other ways to do things. We have to find ways to test the quality without breaking every egg, maybe only every 100,000. Right? So the same thing goes for the overhead of project management. We can't introduce the same overhead for that project of creating a solution right, that we do for a project that puts a man on Mars, uh, say, in the next 20 years. So we've really got to think about how to put things in context. And that's going to be important for you in your careers as project managers. Let me talk about a, a little bit about the uh, opportunity. Because right now, I've never seen a better time to enter a career in project management or business analysis. Uh, the um, authors of the book, uh, Project Management Circuit 2025, uh, created something called the Project Management Deployment Index. It uses data from the Project Management Institute, which is the world's largest member association, and also from the International Project Management Association, which is probably about the number two uh, member organization for project management. And uh, they looked at the US growth rate and if you look at 2004 through 2006, double-digit growth, right? Uh, double-digit growth spiking at 86%. Why? Because in that year, PMI made the first ever major change to the PMI certification, the PMP. And uh, there was just a literal rush of people who wanted to get their PMP, who wanted to become project managers, because they wanted to get their certification before that change. But the following year, right, things only slowed down a little, still 20% growth. So if you look a little further, 
and you look at the PMDI for select countries, the G8 and the L5. This is uh, countries like the United States, Canada, uh, Mexico, Brazil, Russia, China, India, um, Germany, Italy, right, France. So they're all the major uh, superpowers, if you will, the economic superpowers at least. Um, you'll see that there's the index has literally doubled every two years, right? Every two years. In, in about a year, it, it goes uh, maybe one and a half times, and it fully doubles uh, in the um, second year. So the prediction right now for 2025 is that the index is going to be 710. So what does that mean for you as a project manager? Well, well, first of all, PMI estimates that there are 52 million project managers in the world. Right? The, that, that's a lot of people, but there's still a lot of opportunity there. The um, opportunity is global. You don't have to be just a project manager in San Diego. Obviously, the Economic Development Group would like you to be here right? and, and practice as a project manager. But I have friends who leave their home country all the time and go somewhere else to manage the project of their dreams. So a friend of mine from Brazil just relocated to South Africa because there was a, a project that he wanted to manage there, an organization he wanted to work with. So project management is a global opportunity, right? There's opportunity to work literally anywhere in the world. So what's driving this future? And I think some of this uh, ties back to the economic development, right? They're, they're looking at the data of it. Uh, but smart businesses are really starting to understand and appreciate the value of project management. Project management lowers costs. It increases efficiencies. Yes, there is a cost to the overhead of project management, but it's small in comparison to the cost that it saves companies. As a result of looking at involvement of users and uh, executive sponsors, you have improved customer and stakeholder satisfaction. Right? So what does any business want? More clients. I used to work with a CFO who said, we always make more money from an existing client than we do a new client. Right? So you want to satisfy your clients so that you can make more money. Right? And then finally, there's a greater competitive advantage. Right? If you're using project management and working smarter and uh, developing your product faster uh, and maybe uh, less expensive. Sustainable organizations, those that are going to be around for a while, right, that aren't going to disappear tomorrow, right, they increase their advantages by really embedding PM project management in the culture and project management offices, uh, PMOs, into the culture. So that's driving the future in the growth of project management. But as much as we have some things that are changing, right, there are some things that are never going to change about the profession. These have been in place since day one, and they'll continue to be an important part from, you know, to 2025 and beyond. Uh, first is the need for both technical and soft skills. It's not just about being able to create a schedule and manage a budget. It's about being able to negotiate, present, write, uh, convince people. Right? There are lots of things that have to uh, happen in, in order to be an effective project manager, and the, it, it always involves technical and soft skills. The second important part is the ability to manage change. And I'm not just talking about the change that occurs when somebody asks for something a little different in the project. I'm talking about how change occurs when you manage big projects that have an effect on your company culture. Right? I, I was uh, just telling Greta as we got underway that I, I know of a PeopleSoft implementation that happened without any involvement of the end users or anyone who was going to use it. It was just an IT department initiative. And the implementation didn't turn out so well. Right? It, it's not so bad. They, they actually had pretty good technical people working on it. But the organization is, is really apprehensive about adopting it and using it. It was kind of forced on everyone. Right? So as a project manager, you want to be able to manage that change effectively. 
The third important one is communication, right? About 90% of a project manager's job is in communicating. Now, that's not necessarily in meetings, right? It's communicating as far as giving presentations, writing documentation, uh, giving reports. Uh, communication comes in many sizes and flavors, right? So you really need to be able to be an effective communicator to be a good project manager. And then finally, the last one that I want to highlight is managing by influence and not authority. Look around San Diego. Look at how companies are organized. Now, yes, the military is still hierarchical, but if you go into many other companies in San Diego, they're a matrix organization. The project managers sit over in the PMO, perhaps, and the functional managers have all the resources. So the project manager needs to work across all the departments with the functional managers in order to effectively manage the project. That means none of the people report directly to you, they report to someone else. Someone else writes their paycheck, someone else writes their performance appraisal. You've got the challenge of getting them to do what you need to have done as the resources for the project. So that's an important skill that you'll have to develop. You know, values are changing, though, uh, which is a good thing, uh, in organizations. And uh, generally, uh, and I think this is true uh, in San Diego uh, and anywhere else in the world, there's a value for leadership, complex problem solving. And by complex problems, I mean ambiguous, not well-defined problems. Right? My students hate it. I always give those types of problems. But it's really important to learn how to deal with them, to be able to put <laughs> a box around them and figure out how you're going to solve it when not everything is known. And the third factor is the um, ability to understand how the business functions and how the business operates. And to that end, the Project Management Institute recently thought about a new triangle, right, a new triple constraint that constrains the career of the project manager. Right? The project manager needs to have technical project skills, needs to know something about the business and how the business functions, and needs to have the leadership skills necessary to get the job done. This is also creating new opportunities. Right? Project management isn't a dead end. Right? Project management has an opportunity to grow into many types of positions, and into management, for example. Right now, uh, managers like to have the PMP certification. Uh, it, it's important to some of them. Um, there are also roles developing as organizations create project management offices. So that uh, helps elevate the status of project management. And then there, there are not many, but there are still a, a few existing companies that have let project management into the C-suite called the chief project officer. Right? So the chief project officer is the C-suite executive that manages and, and guides project management for the organization. So it, there's certainly a lot of room to grow in a career in project management right now. Uh, Mark Mullally uh, was a researcher at the University of Athabasca in uh, Canada, and he was uh, the co-lead of the value of project management study. And basically what Mark says is that after he's talked to a lot of organizations, he found that they value their proprietary practices because it, it creates value for them and gives them competitive advantage to have their little secrets and ways of doing things. But they also need to understand that there needs to be a balance between these proprietary practices and standard approaches. Right? And so the, the smart project managers of the future are going to look at ways of blending the work, blending uh, the proprietary practices with standard practices in project management to increase the chances of success. So the certificate here at uh, the extension really helps prepare you for a career in project management. It's very practical and hands-on. You do get some technical and soft skills. I teach a class called Controlling Project Costs and Risks, but I, it's not just about technical skills. I, I, I talk about some of the soft skills needed as well. Uh, there's also cross-industry and global perspectives. Right? Project management truly should be a portable career that works in any industry. Right? 
the uh, best project managers can operate uh, in, in any part of the world, in any industry, because they have the key basic skills that they've been put together. And finally, when you're done with the, uh, the certificate program here, you have an opportunity for a capstone experience which helps you pull everything together that you've learned. And there's a project simulation that you go through uh, that helps you uh, reinforce everything that you've learned through the program. So let's turn our attention for just a, a couple minutes to business analysis, right? Because it really takes a business analyst and a project manager to work hand in hand. And business analysis is a discipline that helps to identify business needs and the solutions to business problems that deliver value to the stakeholders, right? And guess what? It's projects then that deliver those solutions to the stakeholders. So there's a very close tie between the two. Some of the realities of being a, a business analyst are that uh, very often you as the technical practitioner, you need to become a leader as well, right? You use your technical skills that you've developed and learn some soft skills uh, and become a business analyst. Here in San Diego, where we have a lot of small employers, yes, we do have our, our share of large ones, but a disproportionate number of small employers, you very often find people in dual roles. Uh, I, I worked for a division of General Electric Company for many years, but I was the pr project manager slash business analyst, right? I managed the projects, but I also had to write the requirements. I've come across companies here in San Diego where it's the other way around. The business analyst develops the requirements and then manages the projects, right? The, the larger companies are the ones that might separate them into separate roles, right? And so, uh, you know, some, uh, some project managers who've been around for a long time have to understand that nobody's taking their job away, but really what we're trying to do is get some clarity to the roles and give a little bit of separation to help everybody uh, succeed a little more. Because the business analyst really needs to take a holistic approach. They can't just look at systems and data. They have to look at people. How is the organization functioning? How is uh, the solution going to impact the organization? Do we need training for people in the organization in order to carry out this project? And so there are a lot of different uh, aspects that have to be included there. The business analyst then, uh, as a career attribute, uh, builds on their technical expertise, right? uh, builds on their uh, skill in some particular area, whether it be coding, right, or whether it be in uh, medical device creation. Uh, the business analyst builds on their technical expertise, adds in some problem solving and decision making, which uh, helps them uh, create better solutions. And then they've also got to have those soft skills again, just like the project manager and communication is very key, including writing, presentation, and facilitation. The business analyst has to be able to talk to everyone from the C-suite to the rank and file employee, has to be able to figure out what is needed to satisfy everyone in the organization. And so communication becomes a really important skill there as well. Extension has created a specialty certificate in business analysis, which is going to help prepare you and first help you understand how it applies in an organizational setting. How, how is business anal analysis uh, deployed within organizations and companies? And then we're going to cover the five domains. The Project Management Institute uh, has identified five knowledge areas for business analysis. And then tools and techniques for assessing problems, identifying the needs and solutions, and writing and managing the requirements and validating that they're actually going to solve the problem we're intended to solve. With that, uh, I'm going to let you know that my contact information is on the deck, so if anybody uh, wants to ask a question after the session, feel free. Uh, and right now I'm going to uh, bring up Greta, who's going to talk a little bit further about business analysis. Unfortunately, a number of years ago, we lost the whole role of a business analyst 
And part of the problem was because we got to the point where we just did so much analysis, and analysis, it was called analysis paralysis. And we would analyze the current system until we were blue in the face. So what happened was over time, this whole business analysis got such a bad name that people just started ignoring it. Well, in the last couple of years, we start seeing all this data, as Ray brought up, about the fact that all these projects are just not working out correctly. They're failing. And the number one reason was because requirements were not understood, they were not implemented, and who's responsible for that? That's really the BA's responsibility. Now, what's interesting is that if we talk about the roles between the PM and the BA, there is a mixture there. And unfortunately, what happens is if you have a very strong project manager, a lot of times they're not going to want to have this other person take over this role of a BA. And on the other hand, if a BA knows how to do their thing, they don't want to have a project manager telling them how to put a requirements management plan together or a traceability matrix or any of the things that a BA knows have to be done. What PMI did a few years ago was they finally recognized they were going to have to put this back in. And at the time, I was actually teaching PMP certification for a company out of New York, and I was doing a lot of global teaching. And I was working with a lot of other instructors who manage great big nuclear power plant projects and engineering projects, construction projects. And there was a new process put into the PMBOK called collect requirements. And they're going, what's a requirement? Because in the construction world, a project starts at the point in time when you start to dig into the dirt, put your hard hat on, your steel toe shoes, and now you manage the project. Well, in IT, the project starts way, way back where you start trying to figure out, why are we even doing this project? So as a result, we started putting this collect requirements in, and half of the project managers who came from IT knew what we were talking about. The other ones were going, I have no clue what's going on here. So they finally started looking at this and saying, maybe we need to start putting a little bit more of this in. Now, that was in the fourth edition. The fifth edition, there was even more. I'm, on the re I'm reviewing right now the sixth edition, which is even more to support this whole business analysis role. So once again, go back just real quick. A project manager is really trying to figure out how to get things done, making sure that the needs of those stakeholders are met. He's got a lot, he, she, have a lot of constraints. They may be resource constraints, they may be schedule constraints, budget constraints. Both my husband and I worked in the casino industry in Las Vegas for a number of years. You do not have a budget constraint in a casino <laughs> project. You only have a schedule. You must have that done on a certain day. And it doesn't matter how much it costs or how many people you need, you get it done. I worked on Katrina, one of the casinos down in Mississippi after Katrina. One week after that hurricane, I went down to try to start to figure out how we were going to get this open. And the CEO said, you will open one year to the date of that hurricane. I'm going, we don't even know what damage was done, much less what it's going to take. It doesn't matter. It will open on that day. So the constraint was, I have a date. Now, unfortunately, or fortunately, whichever way you want to look at it, they didn't say what had to open. <laughs> so I started having some negotiations with the business people and saying, OK, when you open up, do you really need 12 restaurants? Come on. How about if we just have the steakhouse and the buffet and a coffee shop? Okay, Maybe a coffee bar. So we were able to figure out how we could play some games with it. Well, the same thing. When was Katrina? It was in the end of July, right? So what is in your retail stores in August? Sales. They're trying to sell the stuff off before they bring in Thanksgiving and Christmas stuff, right? So 
why don't we do a second grand opening of the retail a few months later? You see what I'm doing? I'm trying to make sure that we get things done, satisfy the needs of the stakeholders, but be able to make sure we are successful. Same thing, golf course doesn't need to open in September in Mississippi, okay? We're lucky if we have April where we can get out and play golf when, when we are down there. So part of this was being able to look at not just the project manager, but the business analyst and me trying to figure out what can I do? How can I meet these constraints but still understand the business? And then being able to put those processes in place. So if I look at what business analysis is, it's really being able to figure out what the business needs. Now, more often than not, I see this first point that says determine the problems and identify business needs. I personally don't like to look at problems. I like to look at opportunities. So rather than saying we have a problem, we have an opportunity to change, to fix something, to make that work. And then come up and identify those viable solutions, which is exactly what I was doing with a casino. We had a problem, we had a challenge, we had an opportunity. We had an opportunity to have three grand openings rather than just one. So look at the marketing aspect of it. Now you just have to be able to look at things a little, little differently. The other thing is, we talked about these requirements. When I talk about stakeholders, stakeholders are a little different to a BA than they are to a project manager. Project manager is concerned about the stakeholder who is possibly going to be upset about what we're trying to do. They're impacted by what we're doing or they're the ones that can actually get so upset they can impact us by putting roadblocks in our way, as opposed to the stakeholders from a BA standpoint, and that is I'm gonna find what we call a SME, a subject matter expert. Those are my stakeholders. Those are the people that I need to make sure as a business analyst, I know who those people are, I know how to work with them, I can pull them in to get things done. Now, Interesting, when we work here in the, with a lot of Department of Defense things, we were teaching over in Las Vegas, and one of the individuals in our master's class said, you know who the scariest stakeholder is? It's the lobbyist, because I don't even know who they are, and I have no idea what they're gonna do to my project, and what their requirements are, or what impact they're gonna have on me. But those stakeholders are the people that could impact you. They're the SMEs, they're the subject matter experts that you need to use as you go through. But I need to make sure that I can facilitate getting those people to come forward and get this solution put in place. Project manager has a schedule, they have a budget, they have the tools, and you're right, most of the time we have no authority we have the responsibility to get it done, but we have no authority over this, these people. So talk about soft skills. Now, sometimes I'm accused maybe of bribery, but I have found that if I'm working with people from another department and their manager kind of wants to manage who they are and what they do, but I also know who his favorite team is. You think I'm not gonna know what bracket he has for the basketball tournament right now? Of course I am. If his team loses, I'm going to kind of stay away. If his team wins, I'm going to make sure, rah, rah, yeah, we got it. Even to the point of dropping cookies off or cupcakes, things like that. Is it bribery? That's what my husband says, but I, you know, it works, okay? Maybe it's just my personality, but um, being able to get what I need to get done. So part of the thing is on a project, the project manager is usually assigned at the point in time when the project has been approved. The BA starts way before that because the BA is part of the business organization who comes up with the idea of what should we be doing? What is the needs assessment that needs to be done? What are the requirements? They are the ones that usually put together or they should be the ones that put together a business case. Why should we spend money on this effort? Okay. 
that business case, and we talk about project management, portfolio management, et cetera, et cetera, there's a process where different organizations in a company will come in with their potential projects, and they have to basically negotiate, battle it out as to who gets it, and it should be based on the business case. What are we gonna get the best return for what we're spending, and why should we be doing this project? Some of the things they talk about is being able to do a cost-benefit analysis, being able to understand the ROI, net present value, present value, IRR, internal rate of return. Those are things that are actually on the PMP exam, but most project managers never do that. They just have to understand why the project was selected, as opposed to the BA, who has to do it? The BA is the one that puts together all that documentation. And unfortunately, or fortunately, however you want to look at it, they're the ones at the end of the project who have to make sure that it's met. Because once the project is completed, the project manager's off to do something else. The business analyst, they have to transition this. They have to continue to monitor and control that project effort, the results of it, to see if we actually got what we said we were going to get. So one of the things that the BA specifically has to do, we talk about having to understand requirements. There are all sorts of techniques that we use to be able to do requirements. There's models we build. There's models that we compare. When I started doing this, I was on the data side. So I would do data models and information models and business rules for the data. My husband was working on the process side. He would do the process flows and the, all the process models. And we were sitting in a meeting with a consulting company in New York City who was in charge of this at the time. And the head said, okay, process people on this side, data people on this side. There were three of us on the data side. The whole bunch were on the process side. And he said, look at each other and say, I hope we sometime can get together. And we're going, wait a minute. Process models talk about verbs. Data models talk about nouns. You need both to have a sentence. And if I don't understand what the verb is, that's the process that's going to make sure that the rule is done that goes along with the noun, and do I understand what the noun is? Do you understand what a customer is? Do you understand when somebody becomes a customer? When they are no longer a customer? What is the process that makes them a customer? What is the process that says they're no longer one of our customers? How do those things fit together? And that's part of what we do when we start talking about requirements and elicitation of that requirements. Now, the picture I have up there is really key because we were talking about the biotech and all. The picture was taken at a PMI student hackathon in Honolulu. We took our project management students, our IT students, and we took our MBA students, and they did a hackathon. The gentleman that's speaking actually, they, they create this bed that, or sheet that goes under patients where they can monitor all of the the life the things that are going on, like their heartbeat and everything. And what he was asking was for these students to create an app that would allow that to be able to be available to family members on their phone when they were not there. So they could be alerted if for some reason the blood pressure went up or low or whatever. And needless to say, that application actually won the competition in 24 hours from the time he presented the idea until the app was working, these students were able to do that. Now, our involvement from a PMI organization was we did a real quick. You need to understand what your scope is. You need to understand what your basic things you're going to do. You need to figure out how you're going to test it. And we did a 15 minute teach them basic project management teach them how to ask a few questions. They went off. It was, it was the most exciting thing that I've seen. And of course, this has become 
pretty common, I guess, among a lot of the students now. But being able to figure out all of these things, conducting those elicitations, asking those questions one-on-one -on -one with that individual, being able to analyze the requirement, well, can we do this, you know, what do we do now? What's the priorities? When we actually got into validating and verifying, now, does this sound a little bit like an agile approach? Absolutely. You have everybody there together, you chunk out a piece of it, and you get it done. But it was one of those things of making sure that we understood exactly what the requirement was so that we could actually produce it. So if I look back at a project manager, and this comes straight out of the PMBOK, there's three things that the project manager needs to have skills to do. They need to have knowledge of project management. They need to know what are the different technical skills. They need to know how to apply that knowledge. And the one differentiation between a PMP and a non-PMP is meant to be not only do you know project management, but you have actually managed projects for a number of years. And the third skill, of course, is the soft skills that we've all talked about that are so critical. Now, when I get into the business analysis skill sets, and you notice I have up there business analysis, not business analytics. They're two different things. Now, granted, business analytics a lot of times follows business analysis. My husband and I are business analysts and project managers. Our daughter is a business anal uh, analytics person. She runs reports for corporate Nissan worldwide. She takes, and takes all the data in, runs all the analytics. Now, does she have to have some project management skills? Yes. Does she have to have some business analyst skills to understand what they want? Yes. But she goes one step further to produce the analytics. So from a knowledge standpoint, it's a little different. Because a BA needs to have business knowledge as well as the industry you're in. Now, that doesn't mean you have to have been there all your life. I've worked for an insurance company. I worked on the cruise missiles here at General Dynamics. I worked on a, process, a project to track the charges for open heart surgery at a, a Texas Heart Institute. I just did a biotech back in Boston. I'm doing a internal affairs project for the San Diego Sheriffs. The reason I can do all these is because I have the skills to be able to analyze what they're saying. When they talk about a thing, whether it's a person, place, or thing, an entity, I ask the questions to make sure I understand what it is and understand the relationship between it and other things. Also being able to understand that cultural and political awareness. This is probably the biggest key that a business analyst has to work in because they're back in the business. They're the ones that are pretty much pushing or facilitating those changes that have to be made in an organization, which are not easy at all to do. Now, some of the other skills, analytical skills. If you don't like puzzles, if you don't like to get down and figure out how things work and why, it's not the role for you. You have to really enjoy trying to figure things out. That's the analytical skill. Also being able to have some creative, critical thinking, systems thinking. And those are all areas that if you're going to be taking a class, whether it's part of what you're trying to do or not, those are so important to be able to, especially critical thinking skills. Uh, a lot of schools now are making that a required course, which I'm, I really am glad. Ray mentioned the facilitation and presentation. That is just something that you have to have. Um, I have the role within PMI for Region 7, which is the western part of the United States, to be the academic outreach advisor which means that I'm responsible for working with different schools and universities in this area. Prior to that, I also was working with the K through 12 
PMIEF, um, which is an educational foundation. And we did a region meeting a couple of years ago in Las Vegas, and one of my speakers was a seven-year-old. He was in a project-based school where every month they had to do a project. And the project that he had done the month before was a map project. And he came and presented to 45 people his map, how he had done the project, all the problems he had run into. And he's talking to 45 adults as a seven-year-old. Now, how many people can actually do that as adults? It's a skill you have to have. Some of the personal, obviously, decision-making, problem-solving, influence, negotiation, all the rest of these we've talked about, they're, they're just skills that you have to have. And, and PMI has recognized the importance of these. So not, you can't just continue your certification by doing additional classes on scheduling and budget, but you have to have some of these other things there. Now, real quick, PMI has the PMBOK guide, which is the project management standard. It also has a couple of BA standards that are coming out, or that have come out. There's a requirements management. This one actually is a practice guide for, the, for business analysis. They are also creating a foundation standard similar to the PMBOK guide for BAs, which will help identify the different domains, the different of activities. The one thing that's very different about PMI and their BA that I really appreciate, they do not tell you which tools to use. They, don't, they are not vendor-centric. They say you need to do process models or data models, but they don't tell you which ones or what software to use, which is, that's not what you should be doing. You should be figuring out, it's a tool. How's it going to help me do my job? So there are a couple of certifications, and Ray mentioned them. Um, the first, obviously, is the CAPM. It's the Certified Associate Project Manager. And I am just a huge, huge proponent of this for anybody who has taken project management classes, is considering going into this field. It is purely based on the PMBOK guide, so it's a fairly easy test. All that it requires is 24 hours of some sort of training, and you can take that. But then it gives you the ability to put some letters after your name to show you know at least what project management is about. And it's a standard recognized um, certification. The PMP, obviously, is the professional, which requires three to five years of experience managing projects as well. And it's not just based on the PMBOK, but everything else under the sun. Now, the business analyst is a new certification, as, as Ray said. I was part of the pilot team to take that certification a year ago, uh, the PBA. It is basically talking about how a project how a business analyst works on a project. Okay, because there are different types of business analysts, some that are just pure business people and then others. They're concentrating on making sure that as a business analyst, you know how to participate and par be part of that project team. So anybody that has any interest in those, please feel free to check with me. In addition, there's other certifications, obviously, that PMI offers, but those are, those are really the ones that are kind of the hot up and coming, especially the BA. So I um, hope that makes sense. I was moving a little fast there, but I need to give it back to Ray to finish up. Thank you. So just quickly, I'd like to uh, wrap up by reviewing some of the requirements for the certifications. Uh, or the certificates here at UCSD Extension. Uh, the first is the Project Management Certificate. Uh, this one uh, is uh, started with your choice of one of three prerequisites. You can either go to a boot camp, which is a, like an intensive training um, you know, for about a week or so uh, and uh, covers everything very quickly. Uh, there's uh, Project Management Essentials, which is a nine-week course. 
uh, meets one, one night a week. And then there's project management essentials in science and technology, uh, same idea. It's just uh, more focused on the science and technology careers. Once you finish one of those prerequisites, you have to take five required courses that are uh, up here. And then once you finish those five, you can choose uh, nine units from uh, quite a long list of possible courses that roughly fall into the categories of general electives, uh, information technology, leadership and management, software engineering management, and systems engineering. The total requirements for the certificate are 26 uh, units. The new business analysis specialized certificate, uh, a, a shorter program, the required courses include the essentials of business analysis, which is an overview, uh, then elicitation techniques, business process modeling, and solution assessment. Now, there is an accounting requirement. Uh, you can take either elementary accounting or uh, a course for uh, non-accountants, and you need to complete that prerequisite by the time you get to business process modeling. But the total uh, requirement for the certificate then is 10 units. Now, the certificate program here uh, is your pathway to other certifications that you can earn from the Project Management Institute. A lot of students I know in, in the various programs I teach always want to know, does does this program prepare me or do I get the PMI certification when I finish the program? And the answer is no. We're not here to provide you a PMI certification. Right? PMI certifications are among the strongest certifications in the world. And they measure three things, which uh, is, is something unique about them. They measure your educational time right, and your educational hours. Uh, which are met by the certificate program. So that's, that's one thing that you will have when you exit the certificate program, is you'll have the educational hours you need uh, in order to complete uh, or sit for the certification exam. The second part is knowledge. And the knowledge, uh, the certificate program is going to expand your knowledge, right? You may, you may have little or no knowledge of uh, business analysis or project management right now. It'll expand your knowledge, expand uh, your horizons, um, but you will still have to take a test. That's very, very PMI centric. And so you will need to prepare for that test, uh, which tests your knowledge then in those areas. And then finally, the third area is experience. And that's something that you're not gonna get from a certificate program. You're gonna get that through your employer or, and you're possibly going to uh, find a position that's going to provide you with that experience because of your certificate, right? So uh, the PMI certifications generally require either three, three or four to four to six years of experience depending on uh, your uh, degree, whether you have an undergraduate degree or just a high school diploma. Uh, so. Uh, you need those three areas before you can take the certification exam. Now, the uh, preparation for the exam, you can uh, get that through the local chapter. Right? The local chapter offers PMP and CAPM exam prep, and they've got PBA coming. And uh, I also uh, recently came across a website uh, that gives you some free materials that allows you to assess your readiness for the exam by, by taking some free practice exams. And that's pmaspire.com. And so you may want to think about uh, that as a resource, okay? So, you know, where does your career go from here? So this is, uh, you know, I, I think there is a, an eight step uh, process that you can follow to create a successful career. Um, first, of course, is to become a lifelong learner. You know, no matter what field you're in, uh, that's something that's going to be required. And you, know, you, you can uh, join PMI, become an active volunteer, uh, keep signing up for classes, get more training from the Project Management Institute, from UCSD. Uh, there are a lot of opportunities there for being a lifelong learner. Second step is to get a certification, right? The uh, PMP, the CAPM, or the uh, PBA uh, are all cer uh, certifications uh, that the Project Management Institute offers that are relevant to uh, your work here. 
Then the next step is to uh, advocate corporate-wide involvement. Uh, because the more people that get involved, uh, the more interesting it gets for you, right? Project managers working collaboratively uh, among themselves and with business analysts also, uh, you know, can, can achieve great results. The PIMBOK guide and best practices and the emerging uh, business analysis guide, whatever that will be called, and I don't think that I, they don't have a name for it yet, do they? foundation, it'll just be a, a foundation standard, but uh, th there'll be some title to it uh, yet to come. Um, so you're going to want to adopt those practices in your organization and encourage the organization to use them. And then you're going to want to assess your environment. And right now there is not an assessment for business analysis, uh, but there is one for project management that incorporates, of course, the, the portion of requirements. And uh, there are actually two good models that are out there. Uh, one is called the project management maturity model. The other is called the organizational project management maturity model. They have similar names, but they're very different in how they operate and how they measure your uh, organization's effectiveness in project management. And then once your organization is maturing, Right? This is your opportunity to really shine as a leader, uh, to advocate for a PMO via a business case, right? to show your leadership skills, to show your analysis skills, and to show your management skills. Show what problems are costing the organization. Show them what the missed opportunities are costing them, right? and stress the strategic value of adopting these standards. And then finally, you know, you begin to mature the organization to uh, uh, advance the practices of both project management and business analysis, and you become a senior practitioner in your organization, a value generator, right? This is what's going to elevate your career up into those positions in the PMO and into the C-suite. Also, I, I, I wanted to point out here, since I, I am actively involved with the PMI Educational Foundation, that the PMI Educational Foundation offers a couple of scholarships that you'll be able to apply for uh, to uh, work here at the uh, extension. Uh, these are not academic scholarships. These are scholarships that support continuing education. You will be able to apply for these two. These are uh, local to San Diego, but this is not the only two that are available to you. The PMI Educational Foundation offers about 50 or 60 different scholarships every year. A lot of them uh, have different, a different set of requirements. Some of them are academic. Some of them are geared toward continuing education. I would encourage you to look at the Educational Foundation and see if there's something here that, that might be able to fit your needs. And then, of course, if you do go beyond the a certificate program here and enter the master's program at the University of Wisconsin at Platteville, which is an option for you as you uh, exit the certificate program, there are academic scholarships, right? That'll help support that work. So I would encourage you to take a look at the PMI Educational Foundation. That's all we have for tonight. And uh, I want to thank you for participating.